Aaron, writer of Thor and the Avengers, and you're watching Jim Mint Collectibles. What's going on, everybody? Jim Mint here, back with another Omnibus review. I just got done reading the Thor Jason Aaron Omnibus Volume 1. The trailer for Thor Love and Thunder had me hyped. This just came out, actually, this week at the time of recording. Had to revisit this material and read it, and man, it's been a hell of a ride. We're going to jump into this, give you a deep dive, thorough review. Before we do, though, make sure to like this video. Make sure you're subscribed. Hit the notification bell so you don't miss a video. And leave a comment so you can be entered into our giveaway for our next subscriber milestone of 150,000. Once we reach that goal, we're going to give away this Sideshow Deja Thoris Premium Format. And all you got to do is, like I said, be subscribed and leave a comment. We're going to pick a random video to draw a worldwide winner once we hit that milestone. Also, I do want to thank Dynamite Entertainment for sponsoring this video. Make sure to check out their new releases this new comic book day, May 4th. They have Dynamite Never Dies Issue 3, Panther Issue 3, Red Sonia, Red Sitha Issue 1, and Project Superpowers Fractured States Issue Number 2. I know I'm definitely going to check out that Red Sonia book, so big shout out to Dynamite. Let's jump into this review. All right, guys, so this is the regular cover, the Isad Ribic Dust Jacket, which has the old Thor and the modern Avengers Thor with future Thor in the back. Love this cover. Uh, the Daughterman cover is actually the image on the actual hardcover itself, so you kind of get that either way. That's one of the DM variants. And then the other DM variant is the Joe Quesada cover, which is on the back here as well. So you kind of get all covers in one if you get the regular cover. Opening up to the inside, as usual, biography on the creators here, Jason Aaron, Russell Dodderman, and Asad Ribic. Then a uh, little kind of pre prelude, if you will, into his epic saga on Thor, which we're going to jump into right now. All right, guys, so retailing $125, has 1,216 pages, and we'll take a look at what it collects when we get to the table of contents. Beautiful opening cover page. And table of contents, I love, again, how it's broken down into the arcs, man. So comics and comic book writers typically make their arcs four to six issues with a potential closing and potential opening in case the series gets canceled, right? So check it out. Thor, God of Thunder, one through five. The series does well. They get approved to continue the run. They drop issue six, which is kind of just like an in-between issue. And then boom, they're back with a five-issue arc with issue 7 to 11 so it continues that ends up collecting thor god of thunder 1 through 25 here then you have thor 1 through 8 which is the first jane foster thor uh with an annual you have the thor's four-part miniseries which was part of the secret wars event then you have mighty thor issues 1 through 12 which is the second volume i guess you could say of the jane foster thor so here we go thor god of thunder 1 like I said, uh, Assad Ribbit covers here. This is the modern Avengers store. And that's what we're going to get introduced to right away. We're starting here with um, the old school Thor in 893 AD. And we get introduced to Thor before he becomes worthy. Uh, Assad Ribbit art. I enjoy Assad Ribbit. He's got a unique kind of painted style. Sometimes the eyes can look a little off to me but i still dig it the first arc here is the god butcher arc so we're going to get introduced to gore the god butcher we start off with thor uh finding this hall of the gods where the gods have been murdered and that sets the whole theme here then it goes to the future and this is thor as the all father so we get a look at thor in the future where he's essentially the last man standing uh fighting against this blackness handiwork of Gore the God Butcher. So continuing on to issue two, showing how our old Thor, uh, how he was not yet worthy of Molnir. And then here we get a little brief cameo of Gore the God Butcher. So Gore the God Butcher's Stark, I mean, it's very sympathetic. I mean, you see him right here, he's bad. He's got this symbiote type of sword that comes out of his right arm, which we come to find out is the Necro Sword that was created by Null. We don't get the Null stuff here, but it shows us this initial battle between Gore and our young Thor. Uh, the, they have a couple of different battles, obviously leading up to future events. But here goes Gore the God Butcher. He'll be portrayed by Christian Bale in the Thor Love and Thunder movie. Awesome art, epic fight scenes, and awesome storytelling as you guys will see as we continue on through here. Here's Thor telling the story here about finding more butchered gods. And that's going to be the theme in this first, uh, these first two arcs, the God Butcher and the God Bomb. Here we have the artwork that was used for the trailer for Thor Love and Thunder, 
which was epic. So cool to see. This is a slain god as well. So they're going to be showing this slain god in the movie. That's going to be crazy. Flashing back to, what was this? The end of the first fight or the second fight with Gore where he's been captured. Kind of reminiscent of the uh, intro of Thor Ragnarok too, if you think about it. So showing all these black demons that are plaguing whatever's left of Asgard. Thor's the only one left and he's just continually fighting those off in the future. So essentially we're going to the past to see the origin of Gore. And then we're going to see the modern times where Gore wins, basically, and, and, and successfully becomes the God Butcher. So after the God Butcher arc, the first five issues, issue six is what gives us the origin of Gore. So he's basically this alien from this planet, had a wife and had a kid. Uh, the planet is struggling. It's very hard to get food. They have to resort to like eating insects and you know moss and allergy and things of that nature. And they pray to their gods, but their gods never come through. And one tragedy after the next finally pushes Gore, the God Butcher, over the edge and he vows to take his anger out against the gods who do nothing for them, you know? So that's kind of like his motivation and, and why he becomes the God Butcher. Love how they include the variants too, Gabriel Del Otto, Hulkbuster versus uh, Thor. Then we jump into the God Bomb arc. So the God Bomb is the weapon that Gore the God Butcher creates which will destroy all the gods throughout all of time simultaneously which is tying into the fact that we have this three Thor story going on at the same time as well it would essentially kill Thor in every era at the same time along with every other god so we, we obviously have to stop the God Bomb here we get introduced to um, the Allfather Thor's three granddaughters I kinda like their story you know uh, it's funny how they hit on Thor at first when they see I forget if it was modern Thor or past Thor. And then they find out it's a version of their grandfather and they're all grossed out. So eventually all three Thors meet up together to try to stop, the, you know, Gore the God Butcher, try to stop the God Bomb. So I don't know if they're going to go that route here. I, I doubt we'll see that in the MCU, but I definitely love that aspect of the story and feeling the different perspective from each Thor, how Jason Aaron's writing them and... They're, they're different battles against Gore the God Butcher. We've seen them all go up against him. Yeah, so epic battle, man, between all the Thors and Gore. And, and Gore being triumphant, raining God blood, raining down hammers, and him readying the bomb. Nothing's in his way to stop him. So Gore, man, the interactions with his wife and his son, I mean, he's kind of, you know, accomplished his goals here. And you would think that he would be happy. But the revelation is that he's actually become the God Butcher, right? So he is everything he hates he he doesn't want to be a god and man he ends up um you know turning his back on his loved ones because of that i don't want to give too many spoiler, spoilers out here but um i like how mature the sun is the sun plays an integral part to uh conclude this arc this is an awesome scene here too man you have our modern thor wielding two hammers and the power of the necro sword Pfft, amazing double page spread here I'm telling you, man, the artwork and the writing combined here is just, it makes this for such a great read. And it kind of ties it back to how, you know, mortals pray to the gods and how the gods come and rescue them based on their prayers. And, you know, how no one showed up uh, when Gore, Gore's planet um, prayed, but, you know, praying to Thor, you know, it was kind of a cool aspect that we don't see too often here. Then we go to issue 12. So it's kind of another filler issue, Once Upon a Time in Midgard. So we get stories of uh, Thor from back in the day and how he used to be with the Vikings then him in modern times it's fun I definitely enjoyed the little one shots or the little in between arcs and then we get introduced into Jane Foster here at this point in time she is dying of cancer she's going through chemotherapy and she refuses to let Thor help her with any like otherworldly magic like she wants to use science to fight this he takes her to the blue part of the moon and everything again beautiful art great story all right, guys, so next arc, the Accursed Part 1, so Malekith joins. So a lot of the Malekith stuff in the early um, arc even builds up to War of the Realms, which I don't think that stuff even takes place until the next Thor omnibus by Jason Aaron. But Malekith, um, he, he finds his way into power, starts conquering realms, and makes a deal with um, the boss of uh, Roxen, uh, the Minotaur. I forget his name. Darius Ager, I want to say, maybe? So we're going to get in introduced into them, and those are going to be the new antagonists for the next arc here. Thor puts together this kind of League of the Realms, or what is it? Defenders of the Realms, or something. Some team of, like, 
warriors to combat uh, this hostile takeover by Malekith. So kind of a little intriguing uh, you know, mystery going on, plus great action and battles between uh, the Dark Elves, who now have the power of the Frost Giants behind them, which also is going to introduce Loki and Loki's biological father, uh, Lafi. Is that how you pronounce his name? So here we have the Nine Realms. They've actually introduced a Tenth Realm, which is Heaven, but Malekith uh, starting to assert power uh, one realm at a time. So we have to follow that. Uh, Thor 18, Days of Wine and Dragon. This seems to be another kind of one-shot uh, filler issue, which they're all good. They give you some more depth on each version of Thor. So here again, Unworthy Thor or Pre-Worthy Thor, if you will. Fighting monsters and doing godlike stuff. And some of the little stuff in this is what's really great. On him just, you know, with, with um, mead and womanizing and all those things that he does after battles or like midway between battles to catch his second win. <laughs> All that kind of stuff is pretty fun. Uh, different artists get switched up on these arcs and and on these little one shots. Roxon. So here now we're going to get introduced Dario Agar, who uh, this is the first time we get introduced to this character, and we get Roz uh, from Shield, who becomes a major player in the run moving forward as well. Roz is her nickname. Her real name is Rosalind Solomon, Agent Solomon. So Dario Agar. So I didn't really like him in the Immortal Hulk run. I thought he was kind of obnoxious really dug him in this series so we get him as just this regular guy billionaire type of person and his whole scheme is to basically mine oil from other realms that's the deal that he has with Malekith uh and, and it works I mean he makes like billions of dollars a day but you know there's something wrong with him he's a minotaur we get his origin and backstory and how that's possible uh and then here's a little flash forward to the future which was an amazing uh all Father Thor versus Galactus. Galactus coming back to Earth to, to you know get some sustenance. No more Avengers or Fantastic Four, so it should be kind of easy. But uh, Thor is still defending Midgard. Roxxon has a floating island in the sky, so that's how they operate, which has like a self-destruct failsafe, of course, that we'll see later on. So here's Dario letting the wolves out or whatever those are. He's always killing his own employees or his own lawyers. He was doing that in the Immortal Hulk run. That starts here. Awesome when he transforms, though, man. He's a, he's a formative villain, for sure. Again, Old Man Thor versus Galactus. Epic, man. Awesome stuff. So, obviously, you know, All Father Thor, you know, prevents Galactus from destroying Earth. But, uh, meanwhile, in modern times, Dario had um, a back and forth with Thor. Thor didn't want him to touch Broxton. Basically, he didn't touch the city that Thor uh, loves and is residing in and just pollutes the hell out of it by putting all his floating islands there and taking over the area. So he's he's down to go head to head with Thor, whether it's like a strategic kind of business strategy or physical fights as well. So we'll see both for sure. All right, guys. So this excerpt from Original Sin is very important because uh, at the end of this battle, and this was a whole Marvel event with the assassination of the Watcher, but um, at the end, Nick Fury whispers something in Thor's ear. And we, I don't think we ever actually get that in any of these issues, what exactly he whispers. But it makes him unworthy. It makes him unable to wield Mjolnir anymore. At the end of issue 25 is where we get the Jane Foster Thor cameo. It's the end of the run and it's leading up to everything that's going to come. Again, unworthy Thor. Uh, here's the Scotty Young variant for issue one. Here's the uh, Dodderman cover. And you guys got to remember, when these issues were coming out, we had no idea that Jane Foster was Thor. I mean, it's common knowledge now. Uh, but basically, we just get this female Thor. We know that Thor has become unworthy and he's unable to lift the hammer. We see Freya kind of looking like she's the one behind the scenes here. And uh, we don't we don't really see because, you know, she's kind of looking at it, this and that. But we don't see who she hands it off to. So a lot of the first few issues of this arc is kind of like, who is the new female version of Thor? But she doesn't go by Lady Thor. She doesn't go by She Thor. She just goes by Thor. So then that kind of makes uh, a little bit of, of a splash. It kind of causes some waves. I believe what Freya did was change the inscription and add the she instead of he on the hammer. Showing, you know, at the end here, this new Thor. 
So Thor, I mean, at first, uh, she's going up against Frost Giants. Mjolnir has different powers with her. It can kind of do a heat seeker, move all around, flat, fast kind of a thing, which never really happened with Thor. Awesome stuff with Mjolnir here, especially near the end of this omnibus that we'll talk about. But for now, it's just, who's this new Thor in action? Malekith, uh, this is where him and Dario start uh, their negotiations, which is cool. And then here's the, the hammer doing all the crazy stuff, hitting all the frost giants. Then we get the interaction between new Thor and our Thor. He doesn't know who she is either. It's funny. He even keeps a list on him on the potential candidates. And he ends up crossing Jane Foster off at one point because, you know, after, after visiting her, she's been staying in Asgardia, which is now floating around Saturn, which left of Asgard. And after he visits her again and she's sick, uh, he's like, nah, I can't be her. He thinks it's Roz. Uh, it could be a Lady Sif. So, it's like, yeah, for the first, what, four or five issues, we don't know who she is, I think. Issue five was one of those filler issues, and really the purpose of it was to show how the Marvel Universe is reacting to this new Thor, villains and heroes. So she goes up against these villains. Uh, what is it? The Wrecking Crew, and uh, the, the female villain just uh, surrenders because she respects what Thor is doing. So it's kind of like, eh, whatever. But it was type a type of filler issue. Uh, here's the list, like I mentioned, of other potential candidates. Thor's trying to figure out who is worthy of Mjolnir and why is he no longer worthy. Here's a shot of Asgardia, Heimdall. Amazing artwork. The all-seeing. Thor's depressed. He's unworthy. This is when he visits Jane Foster. And she's in Asgardia. Boom. Gets her name crossed off. Not accepting any um, magic or anything. She's trying to go through chemo. But here's the problem. So when she wields the hammer, she is granted the power of Thor, and it cures her body. So the chemo that she was that's coursing through her veins was for nothing. Uh, and then when she is no longer Thor, she's kind of worse off than she was because she's never got the treatment for the cancer to begin with, right? So that's kind of the vicious cycle here. And her um, using the hammer every time she changes, it really just hurts her more and more. So that's pretty interesting as well. Little Roz flashback, kind of making us think she could be Thor as she's looking at the hammer as it's on the uh, blue spot of the moon. Love the cover for issue eight here. So I guess this is where we finally get the reveal that she's Jane Foster. Odin is pissed off at this imposter Thor as well. Sent the destroyer after them. Thor recruited all these female warriors and they're all fighting back, which is going to lead to turmoil between Odin and Freya uh, and the return of Odin's brother, the snake. Uh, doesn't help either. She's basically got to sneak back to Asgardia, ditch the hammer, and that's when we learn as an audience that it actually was Jane Foster. So, pretty cool stuff, man. It, it was epic the way that it was uh, it was told at the time. Then we're jumping into the annual multiple stories here. So here's a story in the future: the All Father Odin with his granddaughters, them trying to recreate life on Earth. Touching story. Kind of a cartoonish Jane Foster story here, no big deal. I guess it's supposed to be her fitting in with the Warriors 3 or what have you. Oh, and then there was a cool little Mephisto story here with uh, Viking Thor back in the day. <laughs> it was a drinking contest. Who could drink who under the table? All right, so Thor's uh, 1 through 4. Like I said, this was um, a spinoff or tie-ins to the Jonathan Hickman Secret Wars uh, event from 2015. And at first I thought it was kind of a waste that they put it in here. Yeah, Jason Aaron wrote it. But, um, you know, what was the point? But, yeah, it does tie in with an early version of Jane Foster's Thor. So it does make sense that it's in here. So if you guys remember from Secret Wars, you know, they don't really know that they're on this battle world that was created by Doom and pieced together from all different, like, I guess, continents throughout the multiverse. This area is all Thors from, like, every surviving Thor, and they're the police of battle world. Although somebody is killing their own, like Beta Ray Thor that you saw there. And basically just every version of Thor, fighting every version of Hulk, trying to figure out who killed one of their own. Uh, and, and we do have the unworthy Thor, which is, to me, yeah, the modern version of Thor while Jane Foster is Thor. That's who this is. So that also is why it makes sense uh, as to why this was included into the omnibus. We get some Thor versus Thor action until Jane Foster shows up. She's like the anomaly here. The case that they're working, there are these unsolved mysteries popping up everywhere they're the same female they're this jane foster but none of them know who she is there's also dead donald blake showing up so that's the case that they're working on 
I like the, the Groot Thor that just says, I am Thor. Oh, that's funny. I just noticed that this hammer at the end has changed he or she to they. Whoever lifts up the hammer. Then Mighty Thor won. So that's how this is going to end off with Jane Foster's second ongoing series. She's being protected by, um, what's his name, Volstagg? But he doesn't know she's Thor either, I don't believe. So here's more of, yeah, building up to the War of the Realms. All these dead uh, light elves everywhere. All right, we got a meeting of the minds here. We have Dario, Malekith introducing Loki, who, oh my god, so many double crosses from Loki here. He's good, he's bad, he's good, he's bad. Uh, but here he is with his dad, Lofi. So that's, that's interesting to see. Yeah, I mean, Loki has written so well here. He's powerful, he's formidable in his own way. It's not by strength, it's by strategy and magic. This is an epic scene here. So you have magic and science working together. You have Malekith's dragons dropping rocks and bombs to destroy the planet. Thor goes up there, Lady Thor, to you know ex set off the bombs in the air, falling without the hammer as Jane Foster. This is going to be the trial of Freya. And her falling out of the sky grabbing the hammer, touching the leather strap at the last possible second to transform and not get injured. That was epic. Loki, hi daddy. So you can kind of tell he's going to play his father, but he's, he's playing all sides, both sides at once. Here's the marriage that uh, gains Malekith's power of this realm. Jane Foster Thor interrupting the trial of Freya, hitting Odin with the hammer. That's crazy. <laughs> so they go at it. But during this epic battle... Loki does one of his double crosses and stabs his own mother in the back with a poison tip blade. Dang, I was like, man, Loki is ruthless. But come to find out, you know, that, that wasn't all that it seemed, of course. It's Loki. This issue is pretty cool. So Loki telling uh, an old story to Dario of him and Thor on Midgard back in the Viking times. Uh, and the point of the story is to show how Loki was able to take this dragon's blood and create his own kind of Hulk monsters, if you will. He created this Hulk Viking, and that's what he's going to be promising Dario. Basically, give him a way to have some super soldiers of his own. Loki leads them to another dragon. His team takes the dragon down to get the blood. Therefore, create his own army of, like I said, mindless kind of Hulks. The Jane Foster stuff was written really well as well. When she's just a human and dealing with her, uh, her sickness... Uh, here we have all the other big players of Earth. They're not too happy with Dario, man. He's got this kind of monopoly going on. He didn't want to break anyone off. And you're dealing with people like Kingpin, like people that will try to take it from you. So this was a cool power struggle to see all of these other big villain billionaires going up against Dario. This was interesting when Mjolnir was out there waiting for Jane Foster after her meeting with Roz. And you really get to feel that uh, the hammer is alive here. We learn what it is at the end of this, or at least, you know, Jason Aaron's interpretation. What's funny here is that these two detectives from S.H.I.E.L.D. figure out that Jane Foster is Thor. But we'll see what happens there in a moment. But the last arc, they have to go to this underground Roxin base that's on the bottom of a, a glacier and uh, stop Dario from destroying New York City. He has this failsafe in this building that's going to get triggered. That's going to cause that floating island to crash down, uh, essentially like a meteor. Right? You have all these other bigwigs. They have him captured now. He set off the uh, Dario Agar protocol or whatever, the self-destruct sequence. So that's what the last arc is, is Jane Foster and Roz going down there to, uh, to stop that from happening. So when Thor gets involved, she's trying to prevent Dario from getting killed because then New York City gets destroyed. You have this assassin with golden bullets. When it hits her, it kind of starts changing her back to normal here. And then who comes through the portal to help her? Jane Foster. So that throws everybody off. It throws off the shield agents. It throws off everybody who uh, assumed that Jane Foster was Thor. So we know, though, that she is. So, like, what the hell is going on here? So it uh, ends up just being a manifestation. Um, obviously, Jane Foster is Thor. And... Um, we learn at the end here, she doesn't want to keep it a secret anymore, and she'll have the hammer facade fade in front of everybody. So here we go. Fake version of Jane Foster fades away, goes back into the hammer, or becomes the hammer again, and then she fades to her regular self. So now Rosalind knows who she is. 
And um, it was kind of weird. Yeah, Mjolnir was able to take on her form to, to throw people off. So then we learn right here what the hammer is. We know that it was forged in the heart of a dying star. And we know that it has the power of thunder, right? Or at least grants the power. So it was essentially this storm that has been brewing since the dawn of creation that finally made its way to Asgard. And Odin had to battle and tame the storm. And he put it in this raw chunk of Uru, which was given to him by these dwarves of what Nebelheim. And um, that's when he goes back to them with the storm in the um, the raw Uru and they forge it into Mjolnir as, as we all know. So that's why it has like the heart of a storm in it and uh, leading all up to like this War of the Realms like I said which is funny because it looks like an omnibus on the shelf. <laughs> anyway so we get some afterwards here. Jason Aaron obviously had a few after a couple of issues. The connecting cover Asad Ribic. Uh, then we're going to have an Asad Ribic sketchbook who he also did Secret Wars. That's kind of funny. Gore the God Butcher, Odin. Let's go ahead and dip into uh, my final thoughts. The rest of the book is going to have a bunch of variants, as you can imagine, from all the big names. Yeah, like I said, this book has so much going for it, man. You have the three Thor story. You have the Jane Foster Thor story. And her story is interesting both in the aspect of being human and being Thor. All this stuff going on with Malekith and the War of the Realms building up. The stuff with Odin and Freya. Uh, and then you have the Gore, the God Butcher, the uh, God Bomb arcs, which were amazing, man. I cannot wait to see how much of this is adapted into the film. Gore, the God Butcher, not looking so good based on uh, uh, what packaging art that we've seen. I hope they give him a better look. What do you think, man? Are they going to do the multiple Thors, the three Thors thing? They're already doing multiple Thors because they're doing Thor and Jane Foster, but are they going to do all Father Thor? Are they going to do unworthy Thor, pre-worthy Thor? I don't know, but I'm definitely looking forward to Volume 2 as I would like to read that before War of the Realms. Let me know what you thought about this run, this omnibus, this review in the comments down below. And thanks for watching. Stay minty fresh. Peace.